Great. Okay. So welcome everybody to uh, this AMA session. So we have uh, nine faculty members here at Bates who are very eager to answer any questions you may have. Um, so the way this will work is, um, is uh, I will we'll have each panelist uh, in, in, give a brief introdu introduction to themselves. Um, and then we'll uh, sort of pose some questions. And to get the ball rolling, I have a few questions that, that might be relevant uh, to your interests that I'll sort of throw out there to our panelists. Um, but our hope is that you all uh, engage uh, with questions of your own, because the primary goal of this is to answer your questions. And so with that in mind, I'd like to draw your attention to the uh, Q&A uh, icon at the bottom of your window. You can click that icon to open up the Q&A. And that is the place that we'd love for you to pose any questions you may have for um, any of our panelists. And we'll be happy to answer them. Um, let me first introduce uh, Audrey Burns. Audrey, you want to? Hi, everyone. Great. So Audrey is, uh, is going to be working behind the scenes here, keeping me organized uh, and directing questions to me. If it's a simple question that has a simple answer, Audrey may just go ahead and answer it. So you might get uh, answers in the Q&A from her directly. Um, or hopefully we will have the opportunity to answer most of your, your questions um, uh, verbally. Um, so with that in mind, let me first introduce myself. So my name's Andrew Mountcastle. I'm an assistant uh, professor of biology here at Bates. This is my, I think this is my fifth year here. Um, and my research is focused on insect flight. Uh, and some of the courses I teach are science communication, I teach uh, intro biology, I teach comparative anatomy, uh, and biomechanics. And so I'm going to turn it over to uh, Professor uh, Douglas next. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Um, uh, my name is Amy Douglas. I'm a professor in the psychology department. I teach statistics. I teach a course in psychology of religion. And then I also teach a course in psychology and law, which starts tomorrow. We have our, our new module starting tomorrow morning at eight o'clock. And um, that course connects to my own research area, which is on eyewitness identification procedures. And what I'm really interested in is how psychological methodology can improve police procedures to hopefully reduce or maybe someday eliminate uh, wrongful convictions. So that's sort of my own research area and what I'm interested in. And now I'll turn it over. Professor Elisante, are you next? Okay, perfect. Cool, thank you. Um, hey folks, thanks for, for joining us. Um, I am Ian Cara Elisante. I am in Gender and Sexuality Studies um, program here at Bates. Um, I, teach, uh, I teach race, ethnicity, and feminist thought, which is um, a course I'm teaching twice this semester, and I'm super excited about it. Um, so it, that starts again for me tomorrow. Um, I also teach queer indigenous studies. I teach a course uh, um, called transgender studies. Um, and so those kind of highlight my, my research areas. So really I'm interested in uh, where gender, uh, particularly marginalized genders intersect with marginalized race, race and ethnicity uh, identities. And I think after me is Professor Lundblad. Thank you. Uh, I'm Nathan Lundblad. I am in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. Uh, I grew up in Southern California, but I've found my way to Maine, amazingly enough. Uh, and I like it here. It's a, it's a nice shift from uh, the, the, the sunny San Diego climbs I grew up in. Uh, my favorite courses to teach lately uh, in the physics department are quantum mechanics uh, and quantum theory, things having to do with the sort of weird predictions that uh, physics makes, especially when you get matter cooled down really, really close to absolute zero. And we actually have a lab at Bates that studies the physics of matter at a few billionths of a degree above absolute zero. And that's kind of one of the, that's one of the things I'm most excited about lately. Uh, this coming module starting tomorrow, I'm teaching our junior senior lab physics class where all our physics majors kind of get their hands dirty and start measuring things and dealing with experimental uncertainty and error in, in pretty intense ways. So I'm looking forward to that. And with that, I'll uh, pass off to Professor Reed. 
Hi, uh, uh, so Professor Reed here. Uh, I have been at Bates for 31 years, <laughs> uh, and that's a long time. So I'm teaching the children of some of the students that I taught when I first came in the door, which is, uh, I'll just say exciting. It's just exciting. It's not depressing at all. Um, I teach in French and Francophone studies. I teach uh, early modern uh, literature, so 16th century, you know, 15th to 17th century was my field of specialization. Uh, gender, sex, sexuality during that period is sort of what I focus on. I also, since Bates is a small liberal arts college, I've been able to develop a secondary and now it's more a primary uh, research interest in North Africa and decolonization, colonization, the colonial world in North Africa. And it has really taken over. If I, if it were a normal year, I am on sabbatical, I would be in North Africa or I would be in Paris, but um, I'm here with you now. So, um, so I hope you think that's a win. Um, I also do um, some theater and I'll come back to that perhaps in some of the Q&A or in a way in which we think about um, senior thesis and research. And this has been an, uh, a renaissance for me and taught me a whole lot about the student experience uh, through theater uh, and what the capstone experience is and how students navigate that. So I would be happy to uh, talk a little bit more about that. Um, also teach other things, but I think we'll just move on. It may come up in the context of, of other people. So um, Hiroya. Hi, my name is Hiroya Mira. Um, I'm a music department chair and um, I I'm a composer. I teach uh, music theory and composition at Bates. Um, I mainly write music for acoustic instruments. I work a little bit with electronics as well. And um, I work both with uh, Western classical music instruments as well as uh, some of the Japanese instruments, particularly um, Japanese court music ensemble of Gagaku. And my research interests are um, how music notation affects uh, psychology of the performers and um, uh, different ways of notating music and um, how much of um, uh, indeterminacy and improvisational aspects to include in musical notation. And currently I'm working on an uh, opera for a mixture of Japanese instruments and Western instruments uh, based on the texts of um, um, Kafka and Milena. So, and I also direct a um, um, uh, bass college orchestra. So I'm passing on to Professor Konoeda. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Keiko Konoeda. I am originally from Japan and this is my sixth year at Bates College teaching Japanese language courses in the program in Asian studies. My specialty is language teaching. So I teach courses from uh, very first semester Japanese up to thesis, which some of the students are invited to write in Japanese language. So I am passionate about um, helping anyone who is interested in learning Japanese, perhaps with zero background, to be able to use Japanese fluently before you graduate. So I believe the next stop is Dr. Shrout. Hi, uh, I'm Annalisa Hansen Shrout. Uh, I am in, I'm an assistant professor in the digital and computational studies program. Uh, my training is as a historian. So I get to think about the intersection of data, um, the way that data has been constructed in the past and the way in which it's used to um, both do good and enact harm in the present. So I teach classes on that, um, on the history and entanglement of gender and technology and um, increasingly on um, sort of how to code, how to write code if you're not uh, coming from a CS background. I have a tiny dog who will probably make some noise. I'm really sorry about that. His superpower is barking only when I'm talking. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Professor Ewing is up next. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name's Holly Ewing, and I'm a professor in the uh, Environmental Studies program. The Environmental Studies program here at Bates is a multidisciplinary program. So we have a social scientist, a natural scientist, and a humanist. I'm the natural scientist. Uh, my background is both in geology and in ecology. So I teach the introductory environmental science class starting tomorrow. 
um, and then I teach upper division courses in uh, water and watersheds, in soils. Um, I sometimes teach a first year seminar on landscapes of Maine, um, which is quite different from the landscape where I grew up. I grew up in Oklahoma and so um, Maine is pretty different and it's a really remarkable place to be and a great place to do a lot of field studies. So I'm a field scientist and my courses also include uh, work in community engaged research. And I have uh, my research sits at that intersection of field science, science that crosses multiple disciplines, uh, specifically ecology, geology, biogeochemistry, and, uh, and then also something of community importance. So I work on water quality issues and the study site with which I uh, work most frequently uh, with students is Lake Auburn, which is our public drinking water supply. So I'm happy to talk about research experiences or, or the sciences or anything else here at Bates. And I think I'm the last. Thank you, Professor Ewing, and thank you to all our, all our panelists for those introductions. Uh, for those of you who are joining us late, we're encouraging everybody to pose questions in the uh, Q&A tab on the bottom there. And Professor Ewing, actually, you, that, this was a great segue to our first question that we received. So the question was, uh, what are some ways your classes interact with the community of Lewiston? And so Professor Ewing, would, would you like to elaborate a little bit on how, on how you've done that in your coursework? Yeah, sure. So a couple of different ways. The um, way that's done most extensively within environmental studies is a class that's taken in the junior or senior year that's called Community Engaged Research in Environmental Studies. And in that class, students work uh, in small groups, a group of students with a community partner on a problem that a multidisciplinary problem that is uh, defined by the community partner. So these uh, have ranged from issues like food security to uh, thinking about uh, dam relicensing to uh, issues of urban revitalization. And uh, during the course of the semester, the students work with the community partner. The community partner defines what the issue is on which they would like research done. And then the students undertake that research um, collectively and present as if they were consultants um, reports back to the community. And then those have been built upon by community partners in some cases to obtain grants and other cases to uh, decide how to focus their work, um, and in other cases for community organizing. Uh, and so it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity um, in a very focused kind of way. And then we have additional courses that have uh, perhaps small components that interact with the community um, in, uh, say, a little section of the class rather than having the whole class structured around it. But there are probably other wonderful examples that it's worth hearing about. Thank you, Professor Ewing. Uh, do any of the other panelists like to speak to their experiences um, working within the Lewiston or broader community? Professor Reed, go for it. Sure, so I uh, shouldn't have been surprised, but I was pleasantly surprised uh, at the extent to which uh, Lewiston Auburn is a uh, Francophone town. Um, I knew this sort of vaguely, but uh, it is, um, when I first came 30 years ago, you could spend your whole day in French uh, in, in this city. Um, and it has remained that way, but were, as before, my students would go out into the community and interview old mill workers who had worked during the mills and, and immigrated from Quebec, or their parents were French speaking and they, they, they grew up in French. Uh, the new Mainers of today in the last 10, 12, uh, 15 years have come from Africa and they are Francophone and they are um, a, a wonderful resource culturally and linguistically for our students and some of the ways in which we interact are through immigrant uh, uh, advocacy projects where my students go in and help with interview situations for refugee and asylum seekers, um, where they go in and they, they serve as translators of the language, but also of the culture, sometimes between lawyers and caseworkers and, uh, and, new, and new Mainers. So it's been a boon to us because many of our students do study in, in some of the countries that these people uh, are arriving from. And they need to know certainly the language well, but they also need to know culturally how to act in these situations and why the story that they're getting may be being told in a certain way and to unpack that for, for the lawyers. So that's been a wonderful, uh, we have an ongoing set of translators uh, from our department who work throughout the year in downtown Lewiston. 
Thank you, Professor Reed. Um, I'll mention just two quick things too. Um, for those of you who aren't aware, Bates has an entire center dedicated toward helping uh, faculty members and staff at Bates uh, connect with the Lewiston Auburn community, either through their coursework or through their research. So this is called the, uh, the Harward Center. Um, for community partnerships. Um, I have also worked with them extensively, uh, primarily in my science communication course. So one of the major projects for this course is to have my students, they typically work in small groups to create um, science themed presentations, live presentations for a Lewiston Middle School audience. And so we work with the Lewiston Middle School, both in the conception and creation of those uh, of those uh, presentations, and then also just ultimately go down there and actually deliver the presentations to them. So that's good fun. The other thing that I would mention is um, I'm actually working currently with uh, folks at the Bates Harwood Center uh, to develop a new online platform called Bates Connect, which will um, feature lots of different um, educational enrichment uh, products that Bates students are creating in any number of courses. Um, and and present them on a website that local K through 12 teachers can, can search um, and sort of access um, um, in educational enrichment opportunities for their students. So this is something we're really excited about as well. Um, I see we have another question here, but before we move on, is there any other panelists that wanna say anything about community engaged learning? Okay, we can always come back to it. Let me move on to the next question and thanks for those of you who are uh, throwing Andrew, questions wait. down. Yes. Andrew, you're not yes. seeing Ian. Ian's been waiting. <laughs> oh, thank you. I'm sorry, Ian, I'm sorry. You were off my screen. Please go ahead. That's okay. I felt like an airplane marshaler there for a minute. Um, <laughs> I just I just want to um, offer a perspective as I think the newest, uh, as I look at the screen of colleagues here, I, I'm the newest one of us. And um, I happen to be one of those, those scholars. I mean, I work in the community uh, with LGBTQ young folks for, um, a decade before I really turned to academia primarily. And um, I just, I still believe that scholarship is kind of meaningless unless we can do something with it that, you know, is for the greater good. And so when I started learning about Bates uh, to think about, you know, accepting a job here and learning about the Harvard Center, um, I was like, is this real? You know, is, is, there, is there really a, a center dedicated at this small liberal arts college to helping connect scholarship to the broader community. And I, when I came here for my, my visit, I literally asked several people like, okay, is this all hype or is it real? Um, and people were like, yes, this is real. Um, it's not just talk. And I think as uh, for folks who are in the audience, as you can hopefully hear from what, what my colleagues are sharing, um, this is real. And there are genuine connections to uh, the Lewiston community. Um, I certainly have big plans and we're, have been making plans. And uh, unfortunately, the pandemic has kind of thwarted some of the plans that, that uh, I have in place to connect my classes to the to the Lewiston community. But um, this, this is it's a real thing here. And I think there are some colleges that it's a little bit of hype, uh, but happy to say that that doesn't seem to be the case at Bates. Thank you, Professor Alessante. Um, so let me move on to our next question. Uh, how does the module system influence academics at Bates in ways that other programs may not be able to offer? Uh, so let me perhaps first give a little context. So the module system is new to all of us as well. Uh, so, so this is a response to the pandemic. Um, uh, it's, it's sort of a, a new uh, schedule of delivering courses where we, um, where students take two courses at a time instead of in the typical semester system, students take three or four uh, courses at a time for 14 weeks. In the module system, they're typically taking two courses at a time for six and a half weeks or so. So it's a very compressed schedule. And there are some sort of logistical reasons why we unveiled this for this year to try to sort of minimize um, peer to peer contact and things like that. Um, so with that said, uh, would any panelists like to weigh in on, on the module system? I, I can add something to that. Um, I think maybe the thing to know is that because we just voted today not to use it next year, uh, but to go back to our regular semester, 
Um, the important question is, in what way does the kind of concentrated learning that we were able to do during the modular system translate into something that we might be able to carry over in, in a normal semester, which is what we're hoping to have next fall? And the answer to that is in Bates calendar, we do a fall semester, a winter semester, and then a spring short term. And as uh, Professor Mountcastle said, in the fall semester and the winter semester, students take typically four courses in each semester, but in the short term, students take only one course. And so from a field perspective, which is my um, favorite, uh, I'm able to take students off campus for an entire week at a time to go do a field trip where we will investigate, say, the ecology and geology of Acadia National Park or um, someplace else in Maine or uh, in, the, in the general surroundings. And perhaps one of my uh, colleagues in the foreign languages can speak to how it is that those uh, opportunities might translate into study abroad kinds of opportunities. But I think that one of the exciting things about the Bates calendar is the opportunity to have that period where you have very focused attention on one, on one course. Thank you, Professor Ewing. Um, so I, not to speculate too much, but following up on Professor Ewing's comment, it'll be interesting to see if some faculty for whom the module system really resonated with them and they felt like it was, um, it was a really successful version of their course, they might be looking to move their course to, for example, a short-term uh, scenario. Uh, due to those benefits of having a really compressed time, but more time with your students, as as Professor Ewing pointed out. Uh, great. Um, so uh, it looks like we don't have any outstanding questions. So for those in the uh, in the audience, please go ahead and ask any questions you'd like in the Q and A. Uh, maybe I'll I'll pose a question to our panelists that might be of interest um, to our audience. So one of the things that really impressed me about Bates when I uh, when I started looking into this place, and certainly after I got a position here, was the, um, the really meaningful connections that are created between faculty and students. Um, I remember having a conversation with a, a senior faculty member shortly after I arrived who was just sort of in passing mentioning that they were just having a conversation with a student who had graduated like 15 years ago or something. And what struck me about that conversation is um, for this faculty member, and I think for many faculty members here at Bates, that's not unusual. I think it's it's quite common to have to, to develop really um, solid relationships, meaningful relationships with your students that last far beyond their time here at Bates. Having spent time at other institutions, to me, that was unusual, and that was a, that's a really special aspect uh, of the Bates community in my mind. Um, and so, I guess the question for the panelists then is. The pandemic has challenged the ways in which we traditionally connect, connect with our students in some ways, I think. Um, and so how have you found that those connections have happened? Have they happened differently in different ways um, this past year? Uh, Professor Douglas. So um, thank you. I have the same experience of, of interviewing here as a candidate for a job and hearing my soon to be colleagues talking about their relationships and going to weddings and getting baby announcements from their former students. And that was really appealing, that ability to, to develop those relationships. If there's one blessing that's come out of this terrible pandemic, it's that we are so good at Zoom now. And so my, my psych and law class starting tomorrow, I've decided to really um, lean on my alums who are in various stages of careers. So I have one who's a third year law student at Notre Dame. She's Zooming in one day. I have another student who was really moved by the um, conversations we had in class. He has nothing to do with law as his profession, but he's coming back virtually to talk to my students about the experience of taking the class and then sort of his own pathway after Bates. Um, and I have students who are social workers who can kind of zoom in and talk about how the psychology and legal system connects with their own work and their, their personal lives. So having that ability to connect to students who I've had a relationship with and, and sort of lay some groundwork for students who are going out into the world. And, and you know, I'm not motivated to have every one of my students go to law school. <laughs> That's not the goal. But for those who are interested, it's such a... Um, 
wonderful opportunity to maintain those relationships for myself, but then also cultivate them for students who are here now. And hopefully we'll come back in their own form someday when, when, when we're out of this pandemic, they can come back in person. That would be even better than coming back via Zoom. Thanks, Professor Douglas. Uh, any other panelists have any comments about student connections? Okay, let me move on to the next question. So we just got a new question. Uh, the question is, what are the approximate proportions of discussion-based classes to lecture classes? I'm not sure, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know that anybody, it's a, I'm not sure that anybody keeps that statistic in part because it's probably difficult. It's not really a binary, I suspect, for most, for most classes here. Um, but maybe what we can speak to is how we as faculty try to incorporate discussion-based components into our courses, whether those courses be so small courses that lend themselves nicely to discussion-based um, interactions or ways in which we might try to accomplish something like that in our larger courses. Um, and maybe I'll start off with this. One of the things we're really excited about in, in the biology department is um, we uh, uh, for a long time had what I would describe as a tr sort of traditional introductory biology course. It was a very large course. It was what we call a survey course uh, that we had like two sections of 70 odd students in this course. Um, we covered just a ton of breadth, very little depth. And I think students found that there was sort of a lot of memorization. Some described it as sort of a, a repeat of um, studying for the AP exam. Um, but one of the things we're really excited about is a couple of years ago, we've completely overhauled our uh, curriculum. And so that now the, the intro course that the sort of gateway course into the bio major, um, is students have a, have a choice of a variety of different small research focused courses. So we call these courses cure courses in, in the pedagogical literature, basically they're um, course-based undergraduate research experiences. They're capped at 16 students each. Um, so there's, it's just a much more, much more fun experience for both faculty and students. Students can choose what topics they want in any given year. There are, are multiple of these courses offered. Um, and from the very beginning of their uh, curriculum in the bio major, students will get experience conducting authentic original research. Um, and so, like I said, this is something we started a couple of years ago, um, and we're really excited about it. The students seem to love this new model. I certainly love it as a faculty member. Um, and so, I, in a sense, I guess that answers your question that that's, that's one example of a full on transition from what was traditionally a lecture based course to one that really lends itself more to discussion based and one on one interaction with the faculty members. Uh, would anybody else like to to comment on that? Uh, yes, Dr. Shrub. Oh, um, hello. So um, I can come at this from sort of two perspectives. One is that I just finished um, co-teaching with two of my colleagues in DCS, our introduction to programming course. And you might think that uh, something like programming is a lot of sitting there and memorizing syntax um, but any of you who have taken computer science courses probably know that that is a just a terrible way to learn um, computational thinking and so we build in um, a model that actually we get from industry called paired programming which tells us that when people talk together about what they're learning they learn better than if they're just taking in information on their own and i don't think any of my colleagues will be shocked by this but it's uh, it's really great to be validated <laughs> by research studies that tell us that that's true um, so that's a 100 level course where actually most of the class are students talking to each other, reporting back out, asking questions, watching us do things. I don't think we ever lectured for more than about 15 minutes in one chunk. Um, I teach a, a course on gender and technology, as, as I mentioned, um, and that course is actually one of these community engaged courses where, again, I think maybe I talked straight for 10 minutes. Um, but the rest of the course is students talking to each other, me intervening, all of us coming together. Um, and I think it's it's more fun for me, and I hope for them. <laughs> um, I saw that Professor Lundblad also had a raised hand. Yeah, I was just going to add that uh, similar to biology, physics has undergone kind of a transformation over the last few years in this regard. We used to have you know, a, a very large section of classical physics, another large section of modern physics. 
And what we found over the years is that people were taking these courses for really different reasons. Some people were taking them because they were interested in being a physics major. Some people were taking it because they needed a year of physics to advance their goals as a, you know, going into medicine or dentistry or veterinary. And some people were just taking it kind of out of just curiosity to see what the big deal was. And the curriculum wasn't really addressing these three groups individually very well. So we actually have two uh, kind of separate approaches now. One is a, a very small, maybe 10 or 15 student uh, course for first years and second years, basically bringing people on board into the, the physics way of thinking and uh, setting them up for success in the sophomore and junior physics courses. And there's a whole separate effort that is done kind of in a studio style of 20 to 30 students, all worked, working in groups around tables with equipment uh, aimed at the life science physics students and with uh, the laboratory experiments and the examples kind of catered toward their what, what they're after coming from that side of things. So that's been neat to see the transformation on our end as well. Thanks, Professor Lundblad. Um, so I'll go ahead and move on to the next question here. Uh, the question is, uh, I read that students' first advisors are their FYS teachers. Uh, how do you help advise students with multiple interests? So for those who are not familiar, that's correct. So we have, um, so uh, incoming students, their uh, fall semester, uh, one of their required courses to take is what's called an FYS or a first year seminar. Um, it's a writing intensive course. And the way that uh, the advising works is whoever the, the faculty member who is teaching the FYS, all of those students in, the FY, in that FYS have that faculty member as their first academic advisor. And then once those students declare their major, typically in the winter semester of their uh, sophomore year, um, they will be assigned a new academic advisor within their major. So then getting back to the question, which is a good one, um, how, how do we, I guess we as a community uh, uh, navigate this issue where students may have taken an FYS uh, in an area that they don't intend to major in or decide not to major in? And then how, how does that uh, uh, academic advisor advise them on courses that they might be sort of less familiar with? Um, any panelists have thoughts on this? Professor Douglas. Um, that, thank you, that, that's a great question. Um, so I can talk about how I go about it. And then if other panelists want to talk about different approaches that they have, I mean, one reason that I came to a liberal arts college as a faculty member is because I love the liberal arts and I'm really interested in other disciplines and other fields and other areas. And so part of the helping students is educating ourselves about what's happening in other departments and other academic programs. Um, and our community is small enough that we know where to go if we don't have the answers to the questions. So I would not presume to be an expert on majors in any other academic unit beyond my own, but I do know where to go and how to help students figure out the right people to, to talk to if they have certain interests. Um, so I, when I teach first year seminars, I do love when students major in psychology, of course, but I'm also really interested in hearing about other things they're interested in because it's sort of a a selfish opportunity to learn about things that are happening at Bates beyond what's happening in my own unit. Um, so I wouldn't for myself say that I know all the answers that students come to me with, but I'm certainly happy to help them find the answers. And I enjoy that process about learning ab about what else is here for students to, um, to learn about and to experience. So I don't know if I'll, I'll turn it over to if anybody has any other suggestions or ideas. Heiko, please go ahead. Hi, I think um, Professor Douglas answered the question the way that I was thinking I would answer. But what I would like to add is that many of the faculties that you take classes with are very approachable. And even though they are not your advisors, they are very happy to give you um, advice about how to continue on the 
subject that the student is taking the course in. And if you are in Japanese 101, for example, it is not a first year seminar, but it is a very recommended course for a first semester student. And I would give any advice about the field as well. So the, your advisor is not the only resource that you would have for advising. Absolutely. I would, I would second that as well. Um, one of the things that I discovered in um, my intro biology course is we have this scenario almost every year where a few students have an advisor in a different field, but they intend to major in biology. So what I just started doing is having a portion of one of my classes dedicated toward just sort of telling them about the major and the, and the, um, the procedure of sort of working through it course-wise and the requirements and all the rest of it. So that's, I think it's quite common. And I think faculty members are attuned to that scenario. Yeah. Okay, so uh, looking at the next question then, um, do new Bates students fear the senior thesis capstone and how are they guided to become equipped to complete their final projects? Uh, good question. Um, none of us are students, of course. Uh, I'll just quickly say, my impression of, and, and perhaps it's, um, it's uh, department specific, I don't know, but my impression of students in the bio department is they all want to do thesis. They're like gung ho about it. Um, and, and the challenge is sort of the opposite, which is sort of like, well, you know, you know, let's learn about what thesis opportunities exist. You might want to fulfill your capstone in sort of other combinations because there are different ways to do it. And let's try and try to find the best fit for you. Um, but I'll turn it over to our panelists to see if they have any thoughts about this question. Uh, Professor Reed. So, so maybe this is, you know, I can tell a little story about a senior capstone experience from a very different angle. Um, number one, I would reiterate what Professor Mycastle has said that students love this, embrace it. They love complaining about it. They love binding it together. There are these traditions about you bind it, you scream, you squeal, you dance around the library. So there's great enthusiasm for it, even, even though some of it is cast as misery. But um, I'll just share that I, I'm in an experience now which, which combines a lot of the questions uh, that have come up. Uh, I'm in a play with a student, who, it's a senior thesis project, and I know that Professor Douglas is his advisor or his professor in a stats class and hears about this, but uh, Nikki Longo and I were in a play four years ago, um, and he met me there, and when he had a play that he was doing that called for a 60-something former intellectual, schizophrenic, epileptic man who sells joke books, he said, oh, you know, Kirk Reed, you know, he's perfect. <laughs> so I said, okay, I will, I will take that on. And I had to take that on not as a professor. Okay, I had to be really clear. You're the boss here. And I am one of your cast members and there are three other cast members. They're all students. And it has been a marvel for me to watch him work. He is so prepared for this. He has been so well-trained. I am learning from him as much as whatever he is learning through this experience because he has been so well prepared. And it has opened up the world to me in terms of how, how, I, how, how I'll go back to my classroom and teach. And I, I do use some theater, but students left to their own devices, given some tools, uh, you know, in dialogue with each other. And in theater, you're trying to act out, literally embody the experience of other people the empathy you gain, the perspective on, uh, on, uh, on life that you gain is, is stunning. And as a, as a footnote, uh, the, the lead in the cast is Perla Figuereo, who was in my first year seminar four years ago. Uh, I was taking care of her and making sure that she got through her first year. She is now the co-president of the student body. And in the last scene with me in this play, she is calming me down, making sure I get my medications and patting my forehead with a cool washcloth. She is totally reversed these roles. And, and by the end of the play, I need that cool washcloth and I could not have a better person to pick out of the crowd than Perla uh, to do that. So it really, I think that's somewhat unique. I mean, the, the empowerment that the students get out of that and also, um, you know, that it is a collaboration. You, it's not a lot of people lecturing at you. You're in conversation. You're literally acting out a, a different world. So it's been a wonderful experience for me. Professor Douglas, go ahead. 
so I'll just sort of talk for one second about Nikki's thesis. Nikki is also doing a senior thesis with me and he's in my psychology and law class starting tomorrow. So he better not be spending too much time on his play. Um, but one of the things that Nikki's doing is he's looking at the effect of, of um, intellectual property law on creativity, but within the methodology of psychology. And if you remember from what I introduced of myself, I know nothing about that, but it's been a fun process to sort of learn about it alongside him. But I, I just want to go back to the question, the very beginning of the question, was, which was, do students fear the thesis? And I would say absolutely yes. I, I do think they're enthusiastic and they want to do it. But I've had tons of students in my office in their first year terrified and they feel like there's just no way they could possibly pull it together. And they do. And you have to remember that it's a four-year process before you get to that point where you're writing a thesis. And we're actually here to help you. We, we've chosen this job because we love students and we love teaching. So um, yes, students fear it, but I think I would agree with my colleagues that by the time they get to the end, they really embraced it. And it's something that they can be proud of. And, and they do complain, but, it, but it's, a really, it's a, um, a really wonderful process. Thank you, Professor Douglas. Um, uh, Professor Lundblad, did you have a comment? Go for it. I would add that what happens a lot of times in the sciences is that students uh, pick a thesis project or get assigned a thesis advisor in the, the winter or spring of their junior year and actually begin developing a thesis project or the research in the summer before their senior year. So for example, like I'm going to have a couple students working for me in my lab this summer. One of them will do senior thesis with me in the fall and they'll have gotten a head start into their, their thesis work, really framed what they're doing. Uh, so they really hit the ground running in the fall. It's not required to do it over the summer, but it's it's fairly common in the sciences for this to, to happen. And not necessarily just research ad bait. Sometimes students will go do a summer internship or a summer research project somewhere else and come back and say, I want to do more of that. Can you help scaffold me into understanding more of that or doing the analysis associated with that summer work and maybe building toward a graduate school application or a paper for graduate school that way? Thanks for sharing that, Professor Lundblad. And maybe I'll just follow up with a, a question because I know the question about um, opportunities for students to get engaged in research is a popular one. Lots of students um, are interested in knowing what opportunities are, do exist for students. We've already talked quite a bit about the thesis, um, which many students uh, do their senior year uh, here at Bates. Um, but, um, I guess the question for the panelists is, are, are there opportunities to work with you, to conduct research with you before um, senior year? Is that something that um, you can speak to or have seen in, uh, uh, in your department? And maybe I'll take a stab at that first. So there are, in my, so I think it's somewhat lab specific. Um, in biology, it sort of depends on the research you do and how much space you have in your lab and how many students are currently working in your lab. So there's sort of this um, uh, uh, logistics that, that play a role. Um, but in my lab, I actually have a sophomore currently doing research in my lab. She took my, um, my uh, introductory biology course last year. Um, and she was just really interested. I, I talked a little bit about the research that I do in my lab in the context of that course. She became very interested in it and approached me and said, look, I'd love to work in your lab with, you know, outside of my class time. Um, and I said, great, let's set you up. So she's, she's coming in, you know, she doesn't have as much time as, as a senior does because it's not sort of counting as one of her classes in the way that thesis does. Um, but she's doing great work and I think we're sort of on, on track to, to get her work actually published in, in a year or two. So um, absolutely opportunities exist um, even outside of, of thesis. Um, and as Professor Lundblad pointed out, it's very common, at least in the sciences, for thesis students to essentially start their thesis the summer before their senior year. Um, if funding exists to support them to do that. Um, can any other panelists um, comment on sort of the opportunities to get involved in research before senior year? Professor Ewing, please. Yeah, so uh, I very commonly work with students both uh, very early in their careers and then later as they get, as uh, Professor Lundbad said, right before uh, in the summer before their senior year. And I, I have the ability to support that through uh, a, a grant that 
various grants that come from outside agencies. And so I'm almost always posting about this time of year. And in fact, I have a whole bunch of applications right now through I, that I need to consider uh, for students who are interested in working with me over the summer. And some of those students may, after uh, working with me over the summer, continue to work with me through the academic year. Um, though, as Professor Mountcastle said, often with, with much less time than you have in the, in the really dedicated opportunity in the summer. Um, and I think the other thing that I, uh, well, I'll just, I'll leave it there and let other people talk about the opportunities that they, my opportunities have to do with field work and then lab work in, in association. And, the, and I have a variety of things that I do with students and some of them require more specialized skills, but most of them can be taught to anybody at any level. And so it's very common for me to take students who are fairly early in their time and give them an opportunity to work um, maybe learn from an older student, learn from me, learn from the community partners, um, learn while doing, and then um, some of them go off and major in other things. Some of them stay in environmental studies. Some of them I have an opportunity to um, mentor again, and others I just see at graduation. And, and some of them write to me later and say, oh, this is what I'm doing now. And that's, that's really fun. Thanks, Professor Ewing. Uh, was there another hand in our panelists raised? Uh, yes, Dr. Shroud, please go ahead. Sorry. Um, so I thought I would speak as somebody who's not in STEM, um, because I think there are a ton of opportunities in STEM that are awesome, but there are also opportunities in the humanities um, that you might not otherwise think of. And so for me, um, some of you in the audience may know that there's sort of a move in higher ed to think about the relationship between our institutions and um, sort of deep histories in the United States of things like the expropriation of indigenous folks and um, slavery. And so that's, this is a conversation that was happening at Bates far before I came. Um, it was pioneered by Dr. Sue Houchins. Um, it was just amazing. And if you come here, I encourage you to seek her out and, and Professor Joe Hall in history. Um, but when I came in, one of the questions was um, sort of what does, how, how did Bates's early financial history have a relationship to the institution of slavery in the United States. Um, we're in a mill town that produced cotton, and so that, that's a connection. Um, and so I've been working for the past two years um, in, in a class, um, sort of like the uh, course-based undergraduate research experience that Dr. Mountcastle talked about, to go into the college archives and the archives of um, the mill companies in Lewiston, extract information um, and, and data, and then analyze it in sort of um, a, a more quantitative mode. Um, so I'm actually presenting about the output of that class this Saturday at the New England Historical Association Conference. Um, and so I think there are also, uh, for those of us who don't have labs, these opportunities to sort of move projects along every semester. And one of the things that was really cool this semester is that students got to see work that previous students had done and, and build on it. And so there's this sort of cohort of folks who have contributed small pieces to this project um, in a really exciting way. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Shrout. And I'm just noticing the time. We have reached the end of our uh, scheduled time for this uh, AMA panel. Um, thank you all for your wonderful questions. Thank you to our panelists for so graciously answering them. Um, we have the admissions office has set up a number of more uh, uh, sort of panel opportunities, uh, sessions in the coming weeks. So keep an eye on those. Check those out. Some of those may interest you. Um, and the last thing I would point out is um, the admissions office uh, set up sort of an online engagement platform called the DEN that hopefully you have all seen invitations to. Some, hopefully many of you are already on the DEN. Uh, many of us panelists are on the DEN as well, uh, including I know uh, Ian and I are on there. Um, so I encourage you to ask, you know, to go to the DEN. If you have any outstanding questions that you didn't get answered tonight, um, please feel free to reach out to us or any other faculty members, or there are lots of student representatives on the DEN as well. Um, and you can get lots more information and make connection with current students and faculty members on that platform as well. Uh, thank you all so much, and I hope you have a great night.